Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Judith Bruce, a population council and working here with my colleague um, Sophie Suarez uh, and Sarah Green, uh, who, with whom we are jointly sponsoring this uh, webinar. The um, origins of this I'll give you a little few reflections on. In January there was a meeting in which the Child Early uh, and Forced Marriage and Sexuality Working Group um, convened to discuss some of the field experiences and also discuss some of the issues around metrics and measurement um, and having a how to turn their common value system into a set of strategic and shared decisions. Um, at that time, uh, our own offering, and we had a number of council uh, field you know, staff working on in the field, Guatemala and Ethiopia and so forth, um, we brought up the possibility that the council uh, and its newly established girl center and the community of practice, which is the uh, community of adolescent girls practice, could somehow could contribute to the decision making process of the network of the working group, as well as other overlapping, you know, uh, networks, uh, which it represents Polish adolescent girls, girls, not brides and so forth by turning the spotlight on girls 10 to 14 and what happens in those in that age group because the neglect of that age group had been so it comes up over and over again as where things go awry for girls certainly with regard to their sexual identity and autonomy and as we know uh, sexuality is just one pathway that unfolds over a lifetime so uh, we were invited and um, grateful for it uh, by the member we kind of pulled the members and they said yes it'd be helpful to have some of your thoughts on how to decide where to work uh, because new hotspots have changed since the earliest work on child marriage, which actually began in the late 1990s, there have been shifts in where child marriage and, let's put it this way, exploitation of girls 10 to 14 and exploitation of girls under the age of exact age 18 has changed shape and name. Um, so that is the inspiration for this, to offer ourselves as a service and a partner to talk through things with all of you. Um, there will be several parts to this. Sophie's going to give an overview of the community of practice and all the tools, which are learning tools, practitioner focused, uh, and the wonderful website that she is highly responsible for. It's a wonderful uh, asset to us. I'll speak a bit about why focusing on these age groups and the, the power of maps with Ava Roca, who's been a partner a long time, will be chiming in. And um, Christina Manousis uh, will be... Um, of representing the Girls Center, I think presenting some interesting recent information about hotspots and and I think importantly subnational variation, how much variation there is within uh, countries, so that you need to look at those subnational uh, places. Um, and Sarah Green is going to give a welcome as well. So thank you all, and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Um, like Judith said, my name is Sarah Green. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for Sexual Health and Rights at American Jewish World Service, and I also co-chair the Child Early Enforced Marriage and Unions and Sexuality Working Group. Um, the Working Group is a group of uh, advocacy and programming and research organizations dedicated to advancing um, focus on the connection between control of adolescent girls' uh, sexuality and child marriage. Um, and we develop resources and do advocacy around that issue. Um, in January, we had a meeting with a great group of organizations to talk about what this issue means for donors and others. Um, and Pop Council was there and talked to us a little bit about their community of practice. And so this is an opportunity for some of us who are at that meeting and also others who have joined on to come and um, understand this this. Uh, these great tools and, and process. So I'm here excited to learn with along with all of you today and I'll pop back in to um, facilitate your questions and answer session towards the end. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning and good afternoon everyone and thank you Sarah and Judith for those opening um, 
remarks and for introductions to this webinar. As mentioned at the beginning, uh, we ask that everyone keep themselves and their cameras muted during today's presentation until the end so that we can all enjoy and hear uh, the speakers clearly. As a reminder, please feel welcome to send questions or comments throughout the webinar as you think of them. Send them to everyone in the chat function um, found at the bottom of your screen. And Sarah, who you just heard from, has kindly offered to field those questions for us at the end during our discussion. Today, you will hear from me, Sophie Suarez, project manager to the Adolescent Girls uh, Community of Practice followed by Judith again, our COP director, with some possible additions from, by Eva Roca, a consultant to the COP, and followed finally by Christina Masunas, a research analyst with the Population Council's Girl Center. The agenda is as follows. As mentioned, you just heard opening remarks. I'll speak briefly on the COP and what we are and some of our main resources. Judith will review selections of with whom and where to work in the context of COVID-19, especially focusing on the 10 to 14 year old cohort. And Christina will review results of initial filters for selected countries when finding subnational hotspots. Finally, we will wrap up the conversation with discussion, opening it up to everyone for remarks and questions. So let's begin. What is the adolescent girls uh, community practice? Some of you have likely heard me describe it before or are perhaps familiar, but the way the adolescent girls community of practice works is we aim to prioritize geographically anchored practitioners capacity to lead evidence-based change. I think this is especially uh, pertinent today, uh, particularly this piece about geographically anchored change, thinking strategically with partners about how to deliver coverage with quality, shape and capturing uh, existing resources and entitlement so it better serves the girls we're attempting to reach and filling in the gaps where they do not exist, and innovating content through young female center structures deployed by cadres of mentors. We do this by supporting practitioners in designing, implementing, and evaluating effective and scalable programs and programs that really use a protective asset building approach, thinking critically about the health, economic, cognitive, and social assets a girl needs and at what ages. And this is the foundation of our intentional design model that guides practitioners through a cycle of segment-specific information collection and analysis. And to support this model, this stepwise approach, we provide a number of tools and resources to support every step of this process. Uh, uh, so this is our intentional design model, the 10 steps that we use um, to guide practitioners through designing girl-centered programs. I won't go through all of these steps right now, but today our focus is on step one. How do we identify the places with the concentrations of the most off-track girls? because if we don't start with them, we won't reach them. And I hope you'll consider this as we move through today's presentations. So finally, I just wanna highlight the resources we have to support you in this work. We recently developed a new website for the community practice, and I just want to mention some of the key additions to this site here. First, you have essential reading, journal articles, reports, and publication series on how, who, why, what, and where of girls programming evidence. Some, but certainly not all, of the highlights are Building Assets to Thrive, a report by Annabelle Aerocar detailing the use of an asset-building approach in tackling HIV among girls in Ethiopia, Investing When It Counts by Nicole Haberland, Kate McCarthy, and Martha Brady on the priority that must be paid to very young adolescents in order to create true difference in the lives of girls, our Girls Count series, and a piece on the shrinking world of girls at puberty by Kelly Holman that explores the dramatic shifts in safety and scope of access faced by girls as they make this huge life transition. Forthcoming is our intentional design guide, the full title you can see here at the bottom of the slide, which will lead practitioners and advocates through the central concepts that undergird this work, with a focus especially on the girl roster, which some of you might have heard of. Uh, next is our practitioner tool. Um, uh, our open source toolkits and guides for creating effective girl programming on the ground. And these resources really give you the necessary exercises, worksheets, and tool tools for each step of the intentional design model. Uh, some of the highlights in this section is a link to the Girl Center's Adolescent Data Hub, the Adolescents In-Depth Data Guides, which Judith might mention later in this meeting, the Girl Roster, the Building Assets Toolkit, the Making Most of Mentors Guide, and more. Forthcoming is a how-to guidance on map making or social cartography and its value in program design, which I think you'll find very strongly relates to today's topic. 
Next is our program content, open source curricula, highly adaptable and available in many languages from several of our most successful programs and covering a wealth of topics from health to financial literacy to health services access and more. Our webinars are all available online as well, as this one will be after today, and cover a wealth of subjects as well, from the dimensions of transactional effects among adolescents and young women, to our most recent one you might have tuned into in the beginning of the pandemic on stress testing our intentional design model in crisis. Forthcoming is a review of the girl roster, a how-to, but also a reflection on learnings from the field from the last several years of experience. Another on social cartography that will be demonstrative of that guidance and brief I mentioned earlier. And a francophone webinar from our French speaking colleagues on the adaptations being made in COVID. Finally, we have our field experiences and conversations, our slightly more interactive resources, both in their own ways, providing illustrative and informative stories from COP partners and council colleagues on the innovations and learnings from girls-centered work over the year. Our field experiences blog will soon be updated with not only COVID-related updates from colleagues working innovatively and passionately during this time with learnings and strategies that might be relevant to you, but there will be the addition of 20 plus field reports from our partners over the years on the implementation of our approach with adaptation, successes, and challenges amidst a variety of relatable contexts. Some things to look forward to are our interviews with Martha Brady uh, and our conversations on the integration of sports and physical health into girl programming, an interview with Sega Girls School on adaptations in Tanzania to the pandemic in light of girls returning to school, and one with their council's own Sajida Amin on the evolution of livelihoods for adolescent girls over the last several years. Finally, I just wish to highlight two recent additions that have been made that I hope you will find pertinent to your work. Both are an extension of our Building Assets Toolkit, which is intended to help program staff think through the appropriate benchmarks girls must reach to attain specific social, economic, cognitive, and health assets, and at what ages. The first is our Creative Assets and Program Content Guide, developed in tandem with the Adolescent Girl and Creativity Network, a set of 14 additional assets to build social and emotional learning and promote trauma mitigation and healing. And this is complemented by 50 creative activities that can help build those assets, spanning a range of mediums from painting to drama to storytelling, and all meant for low resource settings. And second is our Emergency Assets for Humanitarian Settings Guide and Brief, co-developed with the Women's Refugee Commission. Together with them, we documented how humanitarian practitioners have used the exercise to date, the asset exercise to date, and to refine the toolkit for future use in emergency settings. It includes 70 assets grouped into a core set that are essential for all contexts. And a brief goes along with it that explains this process and offers insights and guidance relevant to development and humanitarian contexts alike. All of these materials are available on our site and I will share a link again at the end of this presentation. For now, I will turn it over to Judith Bruce. Uh, Judith, if you can unmute yourself. I think I'm unmuted. Thank you very much. Um, these tools that Sophie outlined, and a special shout out to Sophie for this brilliant assembly of them, are meant to support practitioners and those they work with. And obviously, you want to see a much closer uh, partnership between donors and practitioners so that the, both the underlying evidence used to plan programs and the metrics to which they're held accountable really make sense, uh, particularly as we drive towards the poorest girls and the poorest communities. When this work began, began getting you know, more and more visibility, um, we did an exercise with the Coalition of Adolescent Girls, many of you are members I know, and asked not just you know, the value system and so forth, but where on the map you're working, where do people, where do real people get real things in real places, and to that extent asked um, of those served, whatever the service point is, are young females eligible and crucially are they specially recruited because as Sophie said right in the beginning if you don't begin with the youngest most disadvantaged girls you pretty much won't get there throughout these years two things have been utterly consistent two groups do not get attention even be even slightly commensurate to their needs or at the critical moment the 10 to 14 year olds that are already off track and this of course are the years in which so much of our identity, physical and sexual autonomy and pattern develop. Um, it, I'm especially interested in 
uh, we have been especially interested in marriages under exact age 15, not just 18, and Christine Manousas will speak a bit about that. So one group are the 10 to 14 year olds who are off track or, and or if on track, that is in school, still living in places where there are high proportions of girls who are married as children or other bad things. And the other group are the girls who are already married. Um, just now recently in work with Syrian refugees in Lebanon, the roster was conducted in both uh, the settlement areas, uh, the camp areas in Beirut, and then the informal but intense settlement areas in the Bekaa Valley. And about 10% of the girls, 13 to 17, and this is not a Syrian pattern, it's a refugee pattern, uh, were married and many with children. Absolutely consistently, wherever we look, these populations are at catastrophic risk and not being reached. So I'm just going to underscore that theme as I go through. And can I, can I change my own slide, Sophie, or do you have to? You can just keep me, Judith. Go ahead. Can you change the slide? There, thank you. So this is a kind of something that was presented about two years ago. We worked a lot with the Girls in Emergency Girls in Emergencies Network Against Overlapping, and it's a range of humanitarian crises, often overlinked conflict, climate change of different kinds, geological shifts, health, we have fast Ebola and slow HIV, obviously both uh, fatal, ultimately, can be, um, and they generate displacement, scarcity, and stress which disproportionately falls on adolescent girls who are already kind of the family credit card. Um, and this, what I call safety net or credit card uh, facility they offer, their sexuality, their fertility and labor, being under the control of others and girls already psychologically by this age, do not believe that their bodies and their life trajectories are their own. Now, we revise this a bit to think about COVID. Next slide because COVID's exceptional um, uh, infectability and transmissibility to others, 10-year-olds um, on up can transmit at the same rate as adults. They may not get as sick as adults, but there's a special level of exposure that the poorest girls likely have under COVID. Um, if, if they're forced out of the, even if they're nominally confined, if they're forced out into public space to provision and so forth. So we decided to break that out highly infectious, less lethal to the young, but a long arc pandemic. And we're still obviously in the middle of it and almost everywhere we work is affected by it. Um, so that, this new condition and wave um, also intensifies the displacement, the scarcity, the stress, um, and brings an exception, brings a paradoxical and difficult role to the girls we're concerned about. They remain a credit card and a safety net in crises, the intensified invisibility, exclusion, exploitation of their labor, heightened household caring and management responsibilities. Um, I can't see the bottom of the slide, so. Um, and the control of their sexual fertility and fertility services inside and outside of marriage, meaning there are many instances we have reported of increases in sexual exploitation, unsafe work, and child marriage. So we have where you work, but also thinking about pre-COVID, during COVID, and whether there really will be a post-COVID, some patterns established may become permanentized. It may well be on the good side. We talked to partners in Benin. They had worked with smaller clusters of girls meeting on a social distance basis within the same general neighborhood, and they thought that was good, but also the negative. Girls who never return to school because their labor has been absorbed by their families, and many of the, many of the places... Uh, as they go back to school, extend the school day. For example, in Tanzania, it's two, it's two hours longer. So many girls, most likely, will simply not be in school again. Um, next slide. So some things to think about. What arenas might we see challenges to girls? Always there, and one opportunity, <laughs> uh, always there, but now um, morphing. They are household managers of younger siblings' welfare in terms of childcare, overseeing educational inputs, uh, being role models, providing physical protect protection, socializing agencies, mother substitute. They are supporting older members, and many had been single mother families where the, a male member suddenly returns, but he's not been in a provisioning role, and the girl and her return finds herself 
co-provider and often co-parent, providing practical food security in many of the programs we're working with, Mozambique, Tanzania, Benin, uh, Guatemala, um, the I imagine indigenous network food security is right at the top of the kinds of scarcity that girls are asked to mediate and through unsafe labor, through meaning putting them in the pathway of potential sexual exchanges, increased pressure for child marriage. Um, I'm gonna focus on food security in a minute more. Um, they may, they're, they feel responsible for expanding the family safety net and they're witness to and subject to domestic violence reports from all over the world, beginning with Western Europe, beginning in this country, the United States that is, um, as to what confinement does um, and, and, and combined with scarcity and stress about the future. A third arena, um, our hero girls are increasingly protectors of their personal security under stress, but without the peer and mentoring support, the girl programming has now courageously tried to keep that alive through some virtual context and, and in most cases, some in -person, selective, safe in-person context. But the pressures increase and the aloneness mounts um, and their sexual identity, autonomy, and health is under increased pressure. They're subject to sexual exploitation inside and outside of marriage. Trades in the marketplace is a good as scarce. And it's a seller's market a girl may find herself having to offer sexual services to actually buy something, to say nothing of just being fielded to the fields, to even in a food secure area, uh, to bring, to take on an agricultural role that she has not previously held. They are the steward also of better outcomes for self and family, or that is their, uh, that is their aspiration. But we find that helping others may directly trade off against their own welfare. Lastly, and more optimistically, this is a big opportunity if given the appropriate visibility and credit for these girls, and I'm talking including the very young ones, the 10 to 14 years, to be seen as social first responders, to the architects of security and a new foundation to civil society, which is now um, more located in the local space. In our work, we, we say we call, we want girls to be safe, happy, and productive, being who they are, where they are. Their visibility in their home communities may have increased in a very positive way that may permanentize the respect for them that they hold for themselves and others. We have in our network good examples of them being provisioners of, secu of food security in Guatemala, providing, raising and providing eggs, um, shaping safety messages and protocols for diverse communities. Um, the Mozambique uh, group went ahead and kind of contacted teachers and others and said, this is what you say, this is what you do caring for the confined and sick family members, leading even convening crisis planning, and strengthening mental health and spirit, which as we know is um, closely related with all else. So that's an opportunity. If we can protect them and make them visible, make them proud of themselves, it's possible that this will be a pivotal moment in how they're seen. In my own work, my late mentor, Maria Saad, in the garbage collect among the garbage collectors of Cairo, which had a very high child marriage rate, tackled it first by investments in 10 to 14 year old girls and had 14 year old girls in pairs lead the tetanus toxoid campaign, which not only was an excellent strategy because they could work inside and outside the household, it surprised people, it was safe, they got credibility, but it also founded a program that went on to eradicate child marriage and many other harmful practices in that community. So this is an opening potentially as well. Next slide. So but thanks to Ava Roca who can unmute herself and dive in if I uh, say any of this incorrectly. Um, I'm gonna present three uh, visuals about food security. So this is Gambia. We were working with partners there and had identified two areas for special interest, the upper river area, which you see, and the lower west coast. The upper area had an extremely high level of child marriage and including ongoing polygamy with not uncommon to find young girls who were fourth wives. And in the west coast area, there was a high proportion of girls 10 to 14 living apart from parents and not in school, a transmigration area. There are three basic categories of food insecurity. One is a little hard to see, Banjul district in the corner there. Um, which has the low, it's under 40. Then we, the medium is North Bank and North River. And the high actually encompasses both these two areas, the rural area of Baze and the uh, urban, more transmigration West Coast. So there's no necessary overlap between type of place and degree of food security. 
Interestingly, in Banjul District, um, the, the, we have the lowest reading in all of uh, uh, Gambia, which is in Banjul City, 22% food poor. Surprisingly, Ava observes, Ava chime in, food security insecurity is higher in households that mainly depend on agriculture for a livelihood. And it's strongly seasonal and insecurity peaking between June and October because of floods. Those of us who think about girls think what else happens between June and October? Are they out of school? The out of school, the girls in school have suddenly a break potentially. Uh, the girls um, out of school may also just have a moment when some special th special festivals and things happen which bring risk. So you may have overlapping seasonal risks. In any case, the point is that this initial mapping helps us, helps us look below the national level, even though it's a very small country, there's lots of variation. Um, think about seasonality, think about population density, and then think about girls under stress. Next, next slide. So this is from Haiti. Um, there was a great question asked is at the bottom, of which we're trying to get a really better picture of the data. It asked, who in the household went a whole day and night without eating in the last four weeks to find high levels of, of hunger among adolescent girls in Haiti? Having a day like that is truly traumatic and formative of behavior, searching, hoarding, and in a sense of insecurity. These, however, which we're showing is the DHS uh, account question, um, girls who went without, percent of girls who went without food in the last day compared with women 40 to 44 who went without food in the last day. And Ava, who's going to give a seminar, a webinar late in September, puts at the top myth, distributing food to the head of household means that everyone in the household will eat. So this has been the battle for both women and girls in gender. Households are not optimizing units. Households are where fairness unfairness begins, not where fairness begins in most cases. So you'll see the darker blue are places where 40% of the girls, in, the, in this case, um, the, on the map as you look at on the left, reported that they went without food in the last day, and then another 30% pretty high levels of girls across Haiti reporting going without food the previous day, compared to a adult women, obviously we don't want to see anybody hungry, but the patterns are different. Girls are not junior women. They're a different segment, a different group. Uh, and again, food insecurity in the time of COVID may change quite a lot in order to secure your food security for a girl anyway. It may mean risky work and she may be working more on others' behalf than her own behalf. And that is what puts her in the line of fire for some of the sexual exploitation abuses that the network and others have been so concerned about. Next slide. This is uh, another myth Eva has written. People living in cities or middle-income countries are not affected by issues like food security. But what we urge in the community of practice is really di appropriate disaggregation. And here you have the uh, different uh, districts of South Africa broken down by food consumption that is less than the household's needs. In other words, uh, experiencing, um, experiencing scarcity. Um, the, if you read the bullets on the side, and my problem for me is I, they are literally blocked out by my own, my, my face here. So maybe, so we can just be moved over a bit so I can just read them through. Or Ava, if you're on the line, can you read the red bullets, please? Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, uh -huh. Judith. So um, this is just a picture of South Africa. You can see the small map um, to the right, which has the provincial level data, which is often the lowest level that you will ever see data disaggregated by. So I thought it would be interesting to get down one lower level, which is the district council level and see what was happening at something more like a county level. Um, um, it's the most analogous thing to the US. So not only are countries like South Africa that are highly unequal, extremely heterogeneous, there are also pockets where things are starkly bad and you know as bad or worse than a country that overall is doing much worse. Um, you can just see whether you know the country at all or not, there's huge variation across the country with dark blue indicating a high per percentage of households that are experiencing food insecurity. And then places where things, at least in this data, which is from the National Income Dynamics Study, 
um, out of UCT are looking pretty much okay. So one thing that's interesting to note to me is that places that are next to each other are can be very different. So you see in the east um, some dark blue areas like Zululand, which is um, quite bad compared to the areas right next to it. And then if you know the country at all, you can see Durban, um, Ithikmini, a little bit below that, which is more urban, and Cape Town in the southwest, which is very urban. And those areas are actually worse off than the surrounding light green areas that are um, more rural. So I think many people would think that rural areas would be, you know, where it's at, cities are where it's at, but um, actually not only there are huge differences there, but within cities themselves, you also have differences. So I've also done some analysis not shown here of Cape Town, which um, many people have visited and know is a highly unequal place. And you can see stark differences even within a relatively well-off city that are um, very bad in terms of food security and other indicators. Um, crises can exacerbate that. So obviously migration is a, a huge factor most of the time. And in a crisis like COVID, you have people leaving cities, um, going back to the places where maybe they were already food insecure and now there are more mouths to feed. And people who stay in those cities um, also are not um, necessarily well off if cities have completely shut down your ability to go to a market um, or to go and get food. And there's um, little urban agriculture there for you to grow your own or have access to food. So migrants to cities can be especially at risk of food insecurity when things are locked down and they might not have connections to networks in the place where they're living. Ava, um, South Africa is a place which doesn't have high child marriage, but has very high adolescent childbearing. So the, you know, kind of the, again, one of the concerns of the group here was sexual risk at early ages. Do you have any comments looking at this and knowing South Africa as well as you do? Yeah, I mean, looking at this, I, I don't have the map of where early childbearing is the worst, you know, on the top of my head. But I would say that definitely when girls are under stress from something like a, a crisis like COVID, they'll trade whatever they have to get food. And uh, their parents may do that for them, or they may make that choice themselves. And often, all you have is your sexuality or um, favors like that, that you'll trade so that you can eat, you know, it's a crisis eating and surviving is, is what's important. And girls in those situations can be at risk of having unwanted sex, um, sex that is without a condom that leads to an unwanted early pregnancy, um, or they may be under pressure from their partners to have a baby at that time, um, whether they want it or not, so that they can prove their loyalty. There's often a large age difference between partners, um, which increases different kinds of sexual risk, both of obviously sexually, HIV, sexually transmitted diseases. Um, so anyway, all of the kind of the headline is going, getting to the right places, and then within them considering different segments, and now we have a third kind of access, which is the, what effects will particular form that COVID has had on location, 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 location. And once a girl, let's say she's taken out of school and goes back home, if it's back home or back inside the house, how would the, the framework of her responsibilities probably won't change. What she has to do to fulfill them may, and some of them may be intensive, being intensive, intensively negative. There may be a few that are productive and positive in, in terms of there's chances for some sort of leadership. Um, next slide. To Earth as well. Um, we have urged with our partners doing evidence-based planning to identify where the highest concentrations of the girls are the greatest risk of the worst outcomes. And having done that, and typically when we start a workshop, um, with organizations, having them put on the map where they're working and then which segments they're working with in an active way. So when we were working in Mozambique, um, and somehow the name of the district got removed here, but it is Tapo Delgado 
Mozambique. And there were, I'm sorry, the top, would, <laughs> the, the, the very top should read that there were 45,000 girls, 45,000 girls, 10 to 14, living apart from parents, right? Very, very high levels. In that district, Organization A distributes health information only. So they were credited with a thousand, they might reach a thousand of these girls for years. They didn't particularly uh, recruit them, but they were working in zones which had high density of girls at risk. Organization B conducted radio broadcasts, um, but they didn't think about who, was, who accessed radios or whether they were actually influenced by them. And the prevailing information from the people within the area was that very few have access, and especially those out of school were out of reach of such broadcasts. So girls living apart from parents, we could give, we thought there was potential, but we couldn't basically say that they were covering any of the girls. Organization C provides orphans and vulnerable children programming to make male and female orphans. And it's 70% boys, 30% girls, because this is still demand led. So you'll get more boys than girls reaching a total of 2,000 per year. So if we take the 45,000, which I apologize, you can't see, we will amend that slide. Um, and we d d subtract the 3,000 that I think is a fairly generous estimation of coverage, there are remaining 42,000. Now over the years, family planning or others, when they estimate unmate need, do exercises like this. So this requires a real partnership between practitioners, donors, and other stakeholders with those who are trying to give us best, the best metrics. We can get to the right places, but we can't really see coverage or the effectiveness of policies. Um, that's why I say policies are nice, but the on the ground programs at scale are the ones that actually make the difference. It's nice if they're facilitated by policies. So in most places, we still have a long way to go. Um, and enumerating that amount gives us some local targets. In other countries, it's a little less daunting. I remember in Gambia, I'm sitting with the Ministry of Health of, of Education Gambia, and there was a district which she'd come from, and there were 7,000 girls, 10 to 14, who were out of school um, and living apart from parents. And she said, oh, and she sort of, it was a big number, but it was kind of manageable. So if you buy, combine the census information with the information the size of the segment, the local administration may find the number you've given them doable and at least gives them a sense of plausible accountability. Um, let me end there and turn it over to my colleague, uh, Christina Minousis of the Girls Center. Hi everyone, Steve. before we uh, do that, I'm gonna allow Sarah to field just one question that was specific to um, the slide, I think going back, um, and then we will move on. Go ahead, Great. Sarah. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, so we did have a question come through the chat asking whether you know the HIV prevalence in young adolescents in the areas of high food security in South Africa for Judith or Eva. I think, Eva, you probably have a better grasp. I can give some generalized figures. Mm -hmm. um, they remain very high. Ava, <laughs> uh, do you have any up to date there? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to... Um post a recent paper in uh, the chat box for everyone to have. But if you think about the overlap between the dark blue areas, um, there is a huge concentration of young people, girls especially, with HIV in the area that's dark blue, like the Zulu community um, in South Africa. So uh, there's a big overlap there that is um, definitely could be related. Um, and I'll be sending through in the chat um, an article from 2019 about what the current data in South Africa shows. And Ava, just a piece of important history. Some of the earliest work that was done in Durban at a point when I think the, pre the population prevalence was north of 25% and very high female to male ratios. Uh, Kelly Coleman, and I believe you were also involved, looked at something like 43 nominally youth serving organizations that were going to be converted to sort of HIV resources for girls and found almost none of them had even girls in their constituency and very few of them were in, engaged in livelihood. So there was a on paper investment, which was not in any way going to reach those girls. Um, I don't know if you want to comment any further, but there was pre preemptive information that the money the investment and the policies were sort of hanging in midair and not reaching the girls at the highest risk. 
Yeah, thanks, Judith. So that was back in probably 2003, 2004 or so. And what that scan, and maybe Kelly is on the line and wants to speak about it instead of me, but um, if she's not, then I'll go ahead and say that what we found was that all of those youth serving places were primarily reaching men who are only considered youth in the most generous uh, extension of the term. Um, they were the ones who were commonly found in those spaces, um, not girls. Girls were not there. It wasn't safe or acceptable for them to be in those places. And it was a, a huge underinvestment in girls in that community who were the ones who definitely needed those spaces more. There's an article called The Girls Left Behind, which gives some of the details. And then Ava and Kelly's work, it gives lots and lots of fascinating, really pathbreaking work at the time. Great. Thank you so much, Ava and Judith. Christina, back over to you. Hi, I'm just, I think Sophia's going to pull my slides up. Thanks, Sophie. And can you hear me okay? Is that Yeah, it's Christina, we can hear you great. Okay, great. Okay, terrific. Um, thanks so much, Judith. Um, so I just wanted to walk through um, some analyses that we've done at the Girls' Center on child marriage. Um, and Sophie, if you don't mind going through to the next slide. Um, we, I just wanted to give a quick overview of the Girls' Center, which um, is a hub within the Population Council. Um, so the Girls' Center, um, is a new research center within the council that generates, synthesizes, and translates evidence to transform the lives of adolescent girls. And it's led by our director, Stephanie Saki, who's on the line. And also just to acknowledge my colleague, Sarah Islam, who's also on the line. Um, and so just to give some more information about our mission and how we differ, um, because we're building on decades of research and programming that's done by the Population Council that has been done by the Population Council already on adolescent girls and other partners. Um, we're really focused on um, ex um, building um, uh, a better evidence base for policymakers and conveying that in a, in a clear way, um, evidence-based solutions to improve the lives of girls. So very practical and translating rigorous research about what works into um, digestible takeaways for policymakers. Um, one of the projects that we're currently working on with support from the Children's Investment Fund Foundation and other donors is developing a new analytical tool to inform decision making and investment throughout adolescence. And this is focused specifically at the subnational level. And so we wanted to walk through how some of this, this work fits in with what Judith has described around subnational uh, targeting of child marriage um, and uh, give a bit more background about what we're planning. And so the, the project that we're working on will culminate in a website that's called the Adolescent Atlas for Action. And the idea is to offer more accessible analytics uh, across multiple sectors and provide insight on vulnerabilities that are connected to policies. Um, and just to say, so this website will draw primarily on data from the demographic and health surveys and the multiple indicator cluster surveys and will help users gain a more clear picture on the challenges facing adolescents in each setting at the subnational level. Um, Sophie, if you don't mind going to the next slide. Great, okay. Um, so just to give an overview of how I'll go through the slides, so we, I thought that I would give a quick uh, summary of some of the geographic hotspots that we've identified and just to say that these, these are countries that I think were generated um, by this working group um, on uh, countries that were of priority and interest. Um, and looking at how much child marriage prevalence varies across countries and within countries. And then I'll walk through um, sort of a case study on Kenya that features some of the data that will eventually be housed on the Adolescent, data, uh, the Adolescent Atlas for Action website. And just to say, so some of the different components that will be of the analyses 
that we'll be looking at will be around subnational variation. So answering the question, does a girl's risk of child marriage vary based on where she lives? Um, looking at this concept of linked risk. So what other challenges currently married adolescent girls face? And sort of drawing some programmatic takeaways from that and, and thinking more clearly about how the, uh, we can apply these results to inform policies and programming. And then also looking at community level risks. And for this, so for the website, and um, I think for all of our work, we're really thinking about an, using an ecological approach for vulnerability that considers how individual and community level factors affect adolescent well being. Um, and you know, this is based on the concept that a developing person involves the individual and, and his or her environment and the interactions between the two. Um, and for this, we are looking at where currently unmarried adolescent girls are most at risk of marriage by age 18 based on the communities where they're living, but also are adolescent girls at risk of other adverse outcomes in the future based on where they live, in addition to child marriage. And then finally, um, and something that this is, this is part of our work underway, is doing a policy scan. So relative to child marriage, are basic protective policies in place? And I think due to um, her slide on policies are, are not enough, I think this is something that we definitely recognize, but we um, know that this is the bare minimum um, and something that we, we want to make sure that we're covering. Um, and then we can have some questions if um, they arise. Um, so if you don't mind going to the next slide. Great, okay. So um, again, these, these are countries that were generated by the working group or put forth by the working group. So we just wanted to feature some of the variation in prevalence levels at the national level. Uh, at the, at, at the, the country level. Uh, so this is the percent of girls aged 15 to 17 who are married by age 15 by country. And you can see the highest prevalence is in the Dominican Republic, which is 9%, and the lowest is in Kenya, which is 1.3%. And just to say, so if you look at um, the, if you look at the full 15 to 19 year old age group, it might be higher. Uh, but we wanted to look specifically at girls 15 to 17 since they were most recently completing the exposure period. So this is the most current data that we have. Um, Sophie, if you don't mind going to the next slide. Great. Okay. Um, so this slide really shows how much child marriage prevalence varies within each of these countries. So each shot that you're looking at represents prevalence of a region or a county within the country. And the goal of this is to give you like a quick sense of the variation in prevalence levels within a country. And you can see for countries like Senegal, there's a lot more variation than there would be for countries like India or Kenya all the way on the right. And we think from a policy and programmatic perspective, this is helpful to know as we look to understand patterns of the practice and the profiles of child marriage in each setting and how to address its drivers. And it's also really interesting that there's more variation within countries in some cases rather than between countries, as we've seen in the, the previous slide, which could be relevant for thinking about setting targets and making investments related to child marriage. Um, Sophie, if you don't mind going to the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, and so just building on that, um, and this is what they just has called hidden hotspots. Um, so this shows the percent of girls aged 15 to 17 who are married by age 15 at the country level, but then also in the region within the country where there is the highest prevalence. And you can see there's quite a bit of variation. So for example, um, if you're if you're looking at Dominican or if you're looking at uh, Guatemala, you see uh, that these bars, these confidence intervals are not actually overlapping between the very dark blue and the lighter blue. I just want to give a quick overview of these confidence intervals. So from a data side, uh, once you stratify down to a very local level, and this is the, uh, the county, this would be the county or the subregion level, the sample size can get quite small. And so we wanted to show some uncertainty with regards to these estimates and how precise they actually are. And so if you see that these, these confidence intervals are not uh, in fact, overlapping. I think that's quite telling that you can see that this, we're quite, we feel quite certain that this 
variation is indeed, uh, is indeed happening um, and that it's not a matter of our sample size being too small. Um, Sophie, if you don't mind going to the next slide. Okay, um, and so then just building on this overview, we wanted to walk you through a in-depth profile of the work that we've been doing through the Atlas and give you an example of what some of the findings might look like for a particular country. And so I'll do that for Kenya, but just to say, so for the, the adolescent Atlas for action, um, although I'm focusing more on child marriage, it actually will cover multiple sectors and multiple countries even though right now we've started with Kenya and India. Um, but we've, we've tweaked it for this presentation to show you how this would apply and how you might glean, uh, what you might be able to glean from the, the results relative to child marriage. So see if you don't mind. Okay. So the, this is a, just a quick summary um, subnationally within Kenya, how much a girl's risk of marriage varies based on where she lives. And this is the percent of girls aged 15 to 19 who are currently married or living in union by county in Kenya, which is the county, not subregion. But you can see there's quite a bit of variation, um, even though a lot of the confidence intervals overlap. But this really, we think, from a programmatic perspective, um, and this is, seems to be made clear in all the previous presentations, but this can help guide programming and investment um, to ensure that it is targeted in the right places. Um, the next slide. Okay, so then building on those descriptive um, statistics and presentation, we wanted to go one step further to look at linked risk. And the goal of this is really to be able to see the connections between different risks and experiences. Are there clusters of goals um, and how can knowing about these clusters of goals and the linking between different risks and experiences help inform policymakers as they decide to fund interventions and craft policy. Um, and so for this, we have done hierarchical clustering of different risks in Kenya among girls 15 to 19. And I should just say this is at the national level. Um, but just to give you a quick sense, based on our analyses, um, child, ma child marriage, adolescent childbearing, having a net use of family planning, engagement in high risk sex, and having an FBI, all of to be very closely linked. Um, and so the takeaway from this is really be that policies and interventions that address one of these areas should address all of them. And this is an opportunity for more integrated programming. And just to give a quick, I know this syndrome this can be quite confusing to interpret, but basically any of the uh, indicators, the indicators that fall um, that are linked more closely. So I'm looking at currently married and ever given birth, so you feel they're connected and that the bar connecting them is quite low. And you know that those, those risks are very closely linked as opposed to overweight, which goes all the way up to six and, and is quite removed. Um, so these are the types of analyses that we're trying to feature on the Adolescent Alice for Action. We're thinking through which indicators to include. And we also know that these, this list of indicators is not exhaustive, um, but it's really based on available data through the DHS or the mix um, and will be country dependent. So in some countries where we have data on FGMC, this is something that we would include. In other countries where we have data on smoking and alcohol consumption and the prevalence of those are higher, then we would include those as well. It's just helpful to know what risks overlap with being currently married so that you can think through how to adjust programming and make sure it's most inclusive and effective. Um, so if you don't mind going to the next slide. Absolutely, Christina. And just an FYI, if you could speak just a little bit more loudly, you're missing out ah, on some okay. most important stuff you're saying. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. And then, as I had mentioned, thinking about this from an ecological perspective, um, we're thinking through how the community interacts with the individual level risks that girls face. Um, and so this could be useful in terms of thinking about how to plan community level interventions. Um, so just for, to, to take a step back, we were interested in seeing among the girls who are currently unmarried, um, where, where are they most at risk of marriage by age 18? And so looking at girls who are currently 15 to 17 who are unmarried, 
how many of them are living in a community where there's a very high risk of marriage by age 18 by county. And so and, and in, for Kenya, about 17% of girls age 18 to 19 were married by age 18. And this is based on data from 2014. Um, and so once you look at how many girls are living in a smaller community within these counties, where the prevalence is above that, where prevalence is above the national average, so heightened risk, you see that more than 80% of girls in four counties um, are at very high risk of marriage by age 18. And we think that this type of information might be helpful as you think about how to target interventions, where to plan, and how to direct very limited resources around child marriage. And this is like the most imminent risk. Um, and then just looking at, so in looking specifically at um, the counties where you, the, the, the counties where more than 25% of girls are living in a smaller community where risk of marriage by age 18 is heightened, so above age 18, we were also interested in looking like what other risks do they face? Um, and what trajectories are they on? And so, Sophie, if you don't mind going to the next slide. Okay. So, in thinking about other adverse outcomes for these, these particular counties within Kenya, um, we wanted to see how, what percentage of girls who live in each of these, these counties were at risk of other adverse outcomes uh, and heightened risk of those outcomes based on um, the women, the, old, the, the women in their communities. So we chose some indicators that we thought were relevant to child marriage specifically um, and some outcomes for girls who are currently married. So I met need for family planning, um, ever given birth by age 18, uh, unskilled delivery, so deliveries or births that take place outside of a healthcare facility, the justification of wife beating in the community, uh, equity in household decision making, unemployment, physical violence, regular alcohol consumption and smoking, uh, risk of diabetes and hypertension, as well as being overweight, obese, or underweight. And so we tried to incorporate and really think through some other health risks that, that um, might be related uh, or, might, or girls who are currently married might be at risk of, so you can think through how to do more integrated programming. Um, and so from this, you can see this first column is the national prevalence of all of these outcomes for each of them among the older cohort of women, 20 to 49. And then we wanted to see if you're a girl who's, if you're 15 to 19 and you're living in one of these communities, um, what, what percentage of girls in these communities are at heightened risk of these outcomes based on the women around them? And so you can see that for some of these communities, the risk is actually quite high. So just looking at the first. Uh, Jimburu, you can see that almost all girls, so 95% of girls live in communities that are heightened risk of marriage by age 18, but they also have a high risk of unmet need for family planning and of uh, adolescent childbearing and unskilled delivery. Um, and we think that this might be useful to um, present together and to present to policymakers as they're thinking through how services can be packaged. Um, okay, and then the next slide, Sophie. Okay, and then finally, so as part of our data analyses, we're also trying to think through how we can link the data with the policies and the evidence on the ground, and this is something that's still a work in progress. But we've mapped some very basic indicators related to policies, uh, around harmful practices and other sectors. I'm just showing the harmful practices one here. Um, so for example, child marriage, child labor, FCMC, corporal punishment, sexual violence, and intimate partner violence. Um, and we're looking, we're, our goal is to look across countries to see if these policies are in place. And just to acknowledge, we, we know that these are the bare minimum and these are not um, exhaustive and also that the implementation of these policies is very important to consider, but we thought that this was a good first step um, to understanding how these issues were being addressed at the country level. And so on the next slide, you can also see these are just a quick presentation of some of the policies around education and the indicators that we've, we've mapped for these different areas within education relative to Kenya. Um, 
Um, you can go to the next slide, Sophie, I think. Um, so thank you so much. I know that was a lot of um, different tables. Um, we hope that, that some of these takeaways might be useful as you think through um, from an advocacy and programming perspective how to address child marriage within countries. Um, and if you have any questions or feedback on how this type of analysis might be useful or tweaked, we would love to hear them, um, especially as we're thinking through how to modify the Adolescent Alice for Action website. Um, Christina, thank you so much for that. Um, I, I'm going to open the floor to our participants to share their questions and comments with us. We've already had a few come through the chat, so I'm going to start with those. Um, before we dive into those specific ones, I think the, the big question that um, the community of practice has, I think for all of us on the line, is you know, what we think of this um, approach of analyzing subnational data in this way. Um, and, and that was, Christina, just thank you for that. That was really fascinating and detailed um, presentation and a great way to help us understand uh, what the approach is all about. So thank you. Um, and, you know, what, what does the, how does this approach of identifying quote unquote high risk or hotspot areas um, for interventions, what does this mean for the work in your organization? Is this helpful to, in thinking about how to decide where you would work how to, um, and what sorts of interventions you would invest in? I think that's sort of the, the question, a, a good question for us to grapple with today. Um, but before we do that, I also wanted to start with some of the questions that came through the chat. And the first one is, uh, what are the different impacts on the human rights of adolescents that were married before 18 and those with early childbearing? And Eugenia, Eugenia maybe you want to come in and clarify a bit, um, please. Do you mean the different in human rights impacts yeah. with child marriage versus early childbearing? Go ahead. Yes, I just, I'm just wondering uh, what the difference is if um, the childbearing is inside of a union or, or not, there, there are some evidence uh, that is uh, differentiated no, on the impact. So, so I'm, I'm trying to assess if the union is a protective factor or mm -hmm. the opposite, because we have evidence in both ways. No? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, this is Judith. Hello? Yes. Hi. Just to make some comments, it's a very good question. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing that child marriage, you know, under exact age 18, and I especially highlight under exact age 15, because at that age, even the health data that people use is powerful. Having a baby under exact age 15 is measurably more dangerous. By 16, if you control for everything, it's more a social factor, of course, it's important. So the risks of bearing children while young are high. They're highest for those under 15. When you marry in most places, you lose more rights than you gain. Um, potentially, where you, whether you can work or not, uh, you're under exceptional sexual pressure, high sexual frequency, often forcible. The younger the girl, the larger the age difference with the partner. So there's a partner differential as well as a disease exposure issue. And then the procedural issues, and this is when you get, when, when policies detail become important. To give you an example, among Syrian refugees in Lebanon, um, there's now increasing child marriage at a levels that they did not have in Syria, but you have to register your marriage and it costs about $400. So the marriages aren't registered. Only 4% of them are registered. Therefore, the vast majority of children that were born in the Syrian diaspora, you know, estimating between 1.3 and 2 million, will be stateless. So you can go through a range of the constraints on the young mother, the, the, the young woman, um, the instability of those relationships um, in the Rakhai uh, area of uh, Uganda, which had, you know, an initial very strong HIV epidemic. Females who were in and out of marriage by 20 had five times the HIV rates. Um, the uh, emergence of being a single mother explicitly early on with no support, with rise with dependence, and then maybe making another liaison later 
which just generates not additional money, but, um, you know, additional dependence. So it is a process of disinvestment and disenfranchising, which includes physical health, go, goes right through lifetime responsibility for the material and caring needs of others. And then administrative costs in between, which may encumber the child, immigration policies and so forth, as well as registration policies. Thank you, Judith. I also want to come in what I think a question that might link to what we're talking about here is across the presentation. So um, Judith, Christina, did you see any significant trends that varied when disaggregating for adolescent for adolescents earlier, earlier exposure levels to education, whether formal or informal, or their literacy and numeracy levels? So the relationship between schooling and child marriage? That's my understanding. Um, Amanda, if you want to come in and clarify, was, was, was well, education a protective factor? Yeah, exactly. Thank you okay. so much. Sure. Uh, Christina? Yeah, oh, sorry. I couldn't tell if I was off mute. No, to say, so I think one of the issues with using cross-sectional data, like the DHS and the mix, is that you often don't have information on the timing of school dropout. And so without that information, it's hard to know if that happened before or after the marriage and to, to make any sort of um, conclusions around causality and the timing of when these, these events occur. So in on other analyses, we've also used um, longitudinal data to look at that. And I think there's, there are quite a few studies that have done that that the council have worked on, but also others. Um, and that's something that's definitely on our radar, but not, but hard to show based on this data. Um, if that answers your question. Well, I, I, we, have, we have things we can send you for Benin and for Guatemala, and it's pretty powerful example. If you do a, if you trace, where's girls attend? Mayan girls attend, about 75% are in school. This drops dramatically to about 20% by the time you get to 16. Meanwhile, the rate of child marriage goes up in a reciprocal curve. So the bad cholesterol goes down, the good cholesterol goes up. Whether girls drop out of school because of pregnancy <clears throat> or drop out of school and then again gets pregnant, in general, they drop out of school and then get pregnant because what you're seeing is a cycle of disinvestment. One reason I at least personally favor the life table method, which you ask, what's the latest, what's the, by this age, what proportion of girls have been married? is that anything that happens at 15 started earlier. It didn't just happen at 15. And so there's a disinvestment pattern. The girl may be you know, behind, if she's in school, behind grade for age. She may have never been in school or she may have be recently out of school. So what you see is an intensified and investing when it counts and a number of other uh, materials uh, document this. Um, the investment begins early, but you have to look at a range of things, living arrangements, school participation, both degree, not just grade. Um, and then I think we will begin to be able to add some, some peer factors, like the proportion of girls who have, uh, you know, three or more non-family friends, social capital reasons. Um, and uh, Kelly and uh, Ava certainly did a lot of work on these kinds of subjects in the case of South Africa, and also Guatemala, also Benin. It's a good question. Um, it's a good question. Thank you. Um, a sort of related question in, Ke in Kenya, or, or another question about the data. Um, you, in, in the case of Kenya, do you anticipate um, any, do you anticipate the decreases in cases of FGM to have any impact on the rates of child marriage there? Um, I don't know. If I, I'm assuming this is a question to yes. my presentation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I think that that's hard to say, and that's not something that we've looked at um, with the data or for this presentation. Um, but again, I think one of the limits of cross-sectional data is that you can't show causality. So we can look at trends and how these trends are correlated, uh, but that's not something that we would be able to conclude. But um, we did see and I think that this is on my one of the slides around linked risk, that attitudes around FGMC and considering FGMC required um, was closely linked to 
child marriage, so girls who are currently married. And so there could be um, an interesting um, analysis, you know, done on that to see if girls who are currently married, or if, 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 if FGMC declines and uh, norms around FGMC are changed, how that might um, lead into child marriage prevalence and, and decrease it as well as a result. But I think that would just be hard to show with the data. This is, there's in most, in many places where there are closed marriage markets, where you're generally marrying within a circle, FGM is a precondition for what's considered a decent marriage. They're both very hard to work on. I think FGM is about the hardest thing to work on, but I believe they're both really economically driven, meaning that the girl's entry into social inclusion and economic survival requires the loss of part of her body to, um, to be married. And so they're very closely related as they're in most places. And one is a precondition for the other. In Egypt, I worked on this many years ago in Egypt, uh, and both were tackled. Um, once you got the child marriage message across, there were still residual messages around FGM, you know, which, you know, it's unclean or, you know, God made a mistake or various ones. But slowly you'd see it change. Migration often changes it to the extent that girls enter new marriage markets, which do not have FGM as, the, as a requirement for being seen as a de decent person for, quote, marriage. And then you have to look at the word marriage. It's not a static term. I think one of our questioners asked that. This is about the most culturally contextual word around. Demographers for years have treated it as a real thing. I think it's a vessel which is used to cover up a multitude of sins or at least suggest protection when there is none. Um, in general, female genital mutilation and child marriage are linked and co-vary a bit. Thank you, Judith and just, Christina. Oh, oh Christina, sorry, go Sarah, ahead. just to say, yeah. our, our colleague from, from the Kenya office of the council is also on the line. Oh, Beth good. and I was wondering if she had anything to add. Sorry to put you on the spot, Beth, <laughs> in relation to that question on FGMC and child marriage. Oh, wow. Um, I, at this point in time, no, but I do agree with uh, what you've all been saying in terms of it's really hard to make any um, references in terms of causality. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, that's my general thought. Yeah. Thank you. Beth, I think a comment you put in the chat is something I would be interesting to focus on now. And, you know, Beth says appreciates this ident identification of hotspots and points out that if only the Kenyan government would direct its resources accordingly. And I think that brings me to the overarching question of, you know, this, um, who needs to hear this? You know, now that we have this information, um, who, you know, where, how can it be channeled for a pr appropriate action? Um, I'm, and so I'm, there are, you know, are we thinking of, international organizations that then move to decide to do certain types of programming um, here or there? Are we thinking about funders who connect with local groups who are already active in those areas and, and discover what, what they are doing around these issues and how they can be resourced? Um, I don't know if that's a question for Judith or Christina or if anyone sort of on the line is, is, is sort of thinking through the, the now what of this. I can offer an answer, but mm -hmm. let's hear from someone else mm -hmm. first. Well, I would say this, watching this a long time now. We need business plans for girls. Hard knows the way we do with everything else. Moving the conversation from the right side of the brain to the left side of the brain. When you can say, as you can with for almost every other pro problem people are tackling, they go, they say, let's see what the data says. Let's use the hotspots. The hotspots, first of all, present a manageable framework and an accountable framework for investment. That combined with the numbers, you know, here or in the district, let's say Capo Delgado, Mozambique. If you go to a local official and say there are 45,000 girls, 10 to 14, living apart from parents already, that's a showstopper, right? Mm -hmm. Now, they then will say, well, what can I do about it? Or then they might say, Oh, gee whiz, we have all these policies and programs. And the next sentence is, 
you have them and good, nice people run them, but they're only reaching 3,000 girls. We have more to reach. The whole issue around uh, HIV, the vastly elevated uh, infection rates of HIV in girls versus males was a prime example of a failure to match need with strategy. I think this community that we're right talking to, which is the active, well-respected international organizations, some of the smaller new um, groups that have come up, which are focused on the mental health and sexuality, the emergence of sexualities, the donors, need to work together and to make the pitch. The sustainable development goals are meant to be not just a new way for governments to lie and you know pretend things are getting better than they are, but to focus down at subnational levels. So you all can be brilliant advocates and say we'll be co-investors with you, we'll work alongside you, but let's go to some borough and let's make a difference. Let's have a time one and move to a time two. But leaving things at the over-aggregated space with no one particularly holding the contract. So my hope is that more and more of us can be advocates using evidence with confidence to say, take a look at this, now let's make a plan. Um, that would be a, I would have died and gone to heaven if that happens. I, I just wanted to add to that, so to say, uh, to Beth's um, point. So when we were first starting with the Adolescent for At Atlas for Action um, project, we had some con consultations with our country office in Kenya, Beth and Karen, and they raised this point, like just showing the data, um, you know, on child marriage. It's not like, poof, child marriage will disappear, and suddenly they think it's important. Um, and so we've tried to be mindful of this throughout the process, and at times I think that means simplifying certain aspects of the analysis or considering presentation formats like web design, which is not something that um, at least I am, you know, traditionally – uh, familiar with. Um, so we're, we're definitely trying to think this through, and I think these types of conversations are really helpful, especially as projects are underway, to get feedback, but also to hear if there are parts that resonate or don't resonate with policy, um, the, the advocacy community, and, and those who work in programming. Um, and also just, um, I think the Girl Center in general has this as a goal um, and our director, Stephanie Saki, who's on the line, I don't know if she wants to comment on some of our other work underway related to this. Yeah, thank, thanks, Christina. I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah. Sorry about the background noise. Um, th this is Stephanie Saki. I, yeah, I, I mean, I think Christina and, and Beth and Judith have all said very well. I mean, this is something we're working really hard to try to figure out how to better get from the data and evidence to decision making. And I think that goes in both directions. Um, so part of the idea for developing the Adolescent Atlas for Action really came from feedback that we got from policymakers and practitioners on the ground just saying that there's a lot of data out there, but it's really hard to get from, you know, descriptions of the levels of child marriage to know exactly what investments should be made for whom, when. Um, so we're so we've been trying to develop this tool in response to that feedback, and the, but it will be a back and forth process. I think of is this useful? Does it answer those questions? How can we change it? And um, the other the other um, point I'll just make while I have the microphone, if you will, is in response to um, a question that Helen added in the group chat mm -hmm. about um, intersectionality and understanding what works. Um, just to say that we are finishing up a systematic review of um, that that's really focused on education outcomes, but it's looking at interventions designed to address gender related barriers to education. And that includes child marriage and adolescent childbearing, as well as kind of the more traditional barriers that, that people think of in terms of education. And um, so that will be available in the coming weeks or months. But one thing I'll say is that the, the challenge is that there are these huge multi-sectoral, very expensive programs um, that have a lot of different pieces and tend to be effective, but we don't really know which piece of them is most effective and they're not really scalable. So I think there's a real question about the next phase, and I know a lot of um, people and governments are already thinking about this. The next phase of work is really to figure out which pieces are the most necessary pieces for investment and how to turn these very complex multi-sectoral programs into something that can be scaled at the national level or at least beyond, you know, intensive NGO programs. 
So we're happy to share those findings um, as they come out and, and other relevant resources to this conversation. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, and it's great to you know hear the thinking that um, Pop Council is is working through on how, how best to engage with this super valuable data and and great perspective. You know, I think also thinking about maybe how it could be made um, available in in accessible ways to local advocates in the regions that are being you know showcased for their for also for their own activism towards their governments for resources for certain issues in some ways i'm just thinking you know it's sort of like a census and the census process is is going on in the united states right now and the messaging around it of how important it is to participate in the census so that you know your community gets the resources it needs to address the specific problems you have and in some ways this is sort of like you know uh way more sophisticated and helpful for form of census to that end. Um, Eugenia has a, a question coming through. Do you have evidence on how to link interventions to, to address adolescent pregnancy and child marriage? Um, hmm? You ask me. <laughs> I can. This, this me? Uh, sure. Or Stephanie, yeah, I don't I'm, know where or somebody in this. this mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, I can I can jump in quickly and just say that, um, I mean, we could have a longer separate conversation on that question. It's one we're thinking about a lot. But the, the quick takeaway is um, back to what Judith is saying, which is, you know, so if we're looking at this pattern of disinvestment that's happening over time for girls, the response to that has to be um, you know, multi-sectoral and addressing these different areas of disinvestment. And so what we see, generally speaking, is that the interventions that tend to be effective are the ones that address these different areas. So for example, um, we, you know, the combination of interventions that focus on empowerment, but also address poverty or financial type barriers seem to be more effective. And um, this is something where, sorry, Beth, to keep putting you on the spot, but you have much more expertise in a lot of ways than we do. Um, I don't know, Beth, if you wanna talk at all about um, some of the results from the work that you all have done with evaluations in Kenya, but it sounds from, from hearing from all of you that one of the takeaways has been that it might not be sufficient to do very intensive, effective empowerment programming um, if you're working with very vulnerable populations that need some kind of financial or economic empowerment happening at the same time. So that would be one of my takeaways when thinking about, so I know the question is about pregnancy and child marriage, but I think these, these are all really related. How are we addressing gender norms? How are we expanding opportunities? How are we addressing barriers like poverty just to kind of take the, the barriers out of the paths of girls so that they can move forward? Um, Beth, do you have anything from, from the evaluations that you've done in Kenya that you might want to add? Um, well, I can speak to the um, AGIC study, the Adolescent Girls Initiative study. Um, I think especially in Wajir, what we saw is, so um, the components of the Sorry, Sarah, you're breaking up. Beth, now you're muted, but you're, um, we couldn't hear you well. Do you want to try again? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, my internet is a bit shaky. Um, no, just very briefly, because of the internet, we um, had a Hey, Beth, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's fine. Maybe I'll just, uh, um, I'll type it up just very briefly. Thank you so much and sorry for that. Um, it's okay. We'd love to hear from you, yeah, but if you can put it in the chat or, you know, send something as part of the follow-up after the webinar, that would be great. Um, so we're, we're nearing time. Um, we, I know uh, we can stay on the line a little bit longer for those who continue to have questions. Um, I, I think our presenters can stay on the line for a few more minutes. So 
feel free to continue to send questions. Um, we have one that came in from Janelle that asks, uh, how does the Girls Center ensure that evidence, the evidence found is utilized in policies and programs? And Janelle, my, my question back to you is, um, is by whom? Are you, are you by pop council programs in and of themselves or how are, how are the findings taken up more broadly? Is that your question? Yeah, so you guys kind of touched on the question a bit okay. by talking about how like local act, um, activists, pro, um, different governments, and also how popu population council can um, kind of utilize this evidence or how that's like the next step. So I kind of feel like my answer, my question was kind of answered already. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Um, there's one more question, and Judith, you kind of d delved into this a little bit when the education question come up, came up, but I don't know if there's anything else you want to expand on. Um, in terms of the framework that you presented in your earlier, in, earlier in the presentation about what factors would you include around building adolescent resilience and responding to crises? Uh, they're, they're a subset of what we would always suggest, which is, you know, you know, health knowledge about themselves, their bodies and others, social capital, friendship networks and mentoring networks, absolutely vital. You know, I don't think any of us can take on and observe, claim our rights without social context. Um, Age-graded financial literacy and support for cognitive development. Yes, you're in school, but without a study space or even permission to study, these are all things that are goods in and of themselves. They're in the sustainable development goals. And as a package pitched early enough by peer segment, in other words, girls who are like each other, not mixing out of school and in school girls typically, reaching married girls as a group, not just married women. When one does that, goods in and of themselves, but they build the kind of strength and resilience because right now under the crisis, the girls under stress, for instance, <clears throat> for unsafe work, dealing with isolation, child marriage, their past association with other girls will have helped them um, and will have strengthened them. Um, but most of the programs we're in touch with are doing some form of selective contact with them to remind them we're here, you are who you are, you learned what you learn. Um, one group is dropping off lesson plans, not just for the girls, but for the community to do exercises. So contact is especially important, however organized. Phone may not be the best way to do that. In some cases may actually be rejected, our colleague and Bella Rilko, who may be on the line, presented evidence in the first webinar that I think of the five X thousands girls who had phones, 13% only said that they were their phones. And of those only about 30%, the girls still had in their possession. And when reached these were girls in domestic service and under all the risks we're talking about, um, were actually feeling a little at risk to receive calls. So one has to think about the social capital pathways. Um, sense of place is absolutely vital. Um, you know, those who study trafficking and we have as one of our assets, do you know where you're from? Do you know where the governance structure is? One of our partners in Uganda did the community scan and left basically maps of where things are located. And in the Girls in Emergencies Collaborative, one of the first things we spoke about, apart from prioritizing this 10 to 14 year old invisible but important group, is they don't they don't know where the basic resources in their new place are. So that's vital. And it gives you not only a sense of place, but it's practical. And they're often the negotiator for younger and older siblings and their mothers um, of, you know, access to basic resources. So that sense of place united with the confidence in oneself and some recourse. Um, during Ebola, a lot of emphasis was put on, as it is in all pandemics, accurate information. So the girls being connected, we talk about the girls being sort of the BBC for girls, so that they have a pipeline of information that can't all be observed. Everybody can't be washing hands all the time. There's water and other deficits, but at least they become potentially a repository of accurate information. The tetanus toxoid campaign I referred to iconically almost 30 years ago, the girls became associated with trust. Young females are often actually very trusted if you give them trustworthy information, so it's a chance for them to shine. Um, but we will have more and more of this. We are looking at a much more and more 
longer arcs of these crises, more confinement to communities, and ever more vital to both invest in these girls and in their transformational role in the places in which they live. Big agenda. But um, I think that's what's on the table. Big agenda indeed. And maybe um, this is a good place to wrap up our conversation unless anyone has a pressing question coming through. Um, Judith and Christina and Soki, I think this webinar was very appreciated. Um, there seems to be a lot of interest in what you presented and also um, a, a call for, for doing this in Spanish. So I don't know if that's something we can uh, work together to make happen um, and maybe showcase some, some data from Latin America. Uh, not to put you on the spot, you, just, you don't have to answer that right now, but just to give you a sense of you know, the appreciation for this. We're, we were heartened, Sarah, by your, and I was, when Christina showed me the data from Dominican Republic, in your interest in the Caribbean and neglected Central America and neglected mm -hmm. Latin America, and yes, we have colleagues like Angel de Valle and others who mm -hmm. could be very productively engaged in, um, you know, and we're very happy to speak with him and others, in our, and you have an interesting network. We have a lot of overlapping mm -hmm. networks. I think that's a terrific idea, and we also plan to present some of the version of the same information in French at the end of uh, September. And Ava will be giving her webinar. And I guess, Ava, you could probably do it in Spanish also, couldn't you? I think you probably can. On um, the social cartography and, and mapping, and diving more into that as an illust as illuminating tool. So we hear you. We, we want to make this accessible. That's great. Thank you so much, Judith. Um, so I will conclude the Q&A for now and turn it back over to um, Ju Judith to Sophie. wrap up. To Sophie, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for facilitating that. You did an amazing job. I'm taking notes on how to do this well. Um, so thank you all very much for your active participation. It's so appreciated. I will be, just as a note to you all, we're uh, sending a recording of this webinar as well as the PowerPoint itself around, as well as the additional information that was shared by Ava Roca and others. I really encourage you to visit our Build Community for Girls website for the Adolescent Girls Community of Practice. Um, and again, on the note about who really needs this information, I think that was covered really well. I would echo that sentiment that uh, Sarah said at the end, which is it's really also about putting it in the hands of local practitioners. Um, forthcoming, you'll see a lot of field experiences on our website that really demonstrate the the very huge usefulness and negotiation tactic and strategy tool that comes by putting this kind of information and data in the hands of those who are on the ground every day. Uh, thank you all so much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Bye everyone. <laughs>